Well, good morning, church. Good to stand before you and bring you the word of God this morning. I uh, was inspired to this message uh, from a book by Tony Evans. It's called uh, Detours to Destiny. And I encourage you, if you want to know more about this subject, apart from the message this morning, you can pick up that book in the bookstore. I don't get any commission from it, so. <laughs> but um, it was really meaningful to me because of some circumstances in my current life and work situation, and it really spoke to me. So I hope it speaks to you this morning through the Holy Spirit. Our uh, journey as a Christian is one of a destiny. We have a destiny this morning, but certainly we have some detours along the way. And after I finish this morning, hopefully the Lord will have brought to your mind a greater definition of these two terms. There was a uh, unbelievably popular television show a few years ago called Seinfeld. And some of you remember watching Seinfeld. It was a plotless story that just went from circumstance to circumstance with these friends just meandering through life and it was funny and it was uh, jovial and they really had no purpose. They just went from circumstance to circumstance. And there was a uh, university drama club took a poll of American people why Seinfeld was so vastly popular. And they found the results of the poll said that, well, the basis of the show had no plot and that most people live a plotless life. And so what better show to watch is a plotless show if you have a plotless life. <laughs> Sadly, a lot of Americans live their life that way. They're dying to graduate from high school and then they're dying to go to college and then they're dying to get married and have a family and they're dying for the perfect job only to find that down the road they're dying and really not didn't know what the life of purpose of life was in the first place well, we are not to be that way as believers in Jesus Christ what would life look like even believers in Jesus Christ this morning, if we lived life with a purpose, if we lived life knowing we had a destiny, it would be so much different. In fact, we would thrive. I love the lyrics to the Casting Crown song this morning. Here in this worn and weary land where many a dream has died, like a tree planted by the water, we never will run dry. So living water flowing through, God, we thirst more for you. Fill our hearts and flood our souls with one desire. Just to know you and to make you known, we lift your name on high. Shine like the sun, make darkness run and hide. We know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. We were made to thrive. You and I, in the Lord Jesus Christ, were made to thrive. The Bible has many instances this morning of people with definite destinies. They had a purpose of life that they were destined to live. We read about Moses. We read about Abraham. We read about David. And this morning we're going to look at the life of Joseph in more detail as to one who had a purpose and a destiny outlined by Almighty God. Put in your outline this morning, Genesis 50, 19 through 20. 
This is at the end of the chapter where basically Joseph saves the nation of Israel from starvation. He looks at his brothers and he says, Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. That's the first key. And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. Man, that's a purpose. That's a purpose, is it not? A destiny that God had for Joseph to basically save the nation of Israel from starvation. But we're going to see in a moment, it really didn't begin there. The purpose and the vision was given to Joseph, but he didn't begin the journey there. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, you have a destiny. You have a God-ordained purpose. You have a God-ordained location that you are destined to because you know him as your Lord and Savior. We first have an eternal destiny. And we're all familiar with that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ. We'll spend eternity with him, enjoying his presence, enjoying a place that the Bible can't even describe how wonderful it is called heaven. No pain, no suffering, just the glory of the Lord. We will enjoy it forever and we will serve him and he will work in us and through us for his glory for eternity. That's the eternal destiny we all have as believers. The problem is we have the here and now to worry about day to day, month to month, year to year. And while some of us will reflect sometimes on a destiny for us in this, what we call our historical period of life, I dare say that probably most of us don't, and we live more like Seinfeld. Just happenstance from here to here, from circumstance to circumstance. And if we're not careful, those circumstances kind of dictate an aimless, purposeless life. Amen. We have an earthly purpose. That's why you were not taken to heaven when you were converted. God has ordained in you and I a uniqueness and a purpose that only you and I can fulfill. I love what Tony's definition of this term destiny is in his book. Destiny is the customized life calling for which God has equipped and ordained us in order to bring him the greatest glory and the maximum expansion of his kingdom. Did you catch that? It's a customized life. It's your gifts and talents. It's you that makes you you, you unique among all the other people in the world. God has equipped and ordained us in order to bring him the greatest amount of glory and the maximum expansion of his kingdom. That is our purpose. That is our destiny in the historical time frame of our life here that we're living in the here and now. That's exciting because he has the power to do that. The Apostle Paul knew well about this. He knew he had a purpose. He knew he had a destiny. He said in Ephesians, To that end, or to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. And he said in chapter 5, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Kind of like casting crowns. Shine like the sun. Make the darkness run and hide. Too often, though, we settle for second best. It's kind of like the little girl who went to her father and said, Daddy, 
I want a new nickel in your pocket. And he reached in his pocket and he was digging around and he couldn't find the nickel. And he said, oh, honey, I'm sorry, I don't have a nickel. He pulled out his billfold and pulled out a $20 bill. And he said, I have this instead. And she threw a fit. No, daddy, I want the nickel. We are like that sometimes. God is offering us so much more, but we cling to our agenda, cling to our things that we think are our destiny. When in fact, God has so much more in store for us. As we sung about this morning in the opening hymns, God is always concerned more about who you are than what you do. He's always concerned about making us into the image of his son and then using us to do things. It's who you are that's really important here. So does God do this? Of course he does it. We're going to see in the story of Joseph this morning. He is an amazing God. Some months ago I talked to you about his sovereignty. His sovereignty means he is God in control of everything. All things. He either orchestrates all things or he allows all things. There is nothing out of his control or else he wouldn't be God. And what is fascinating about this story we're going to look at this morning is how it coincides with our choice, his sovereignty, and the end result of our destiny. He spoke the world into being. He speaks life from death. He raises people from the dead. He will raise all believers from the dead one day. Hallelujah. And he defines your purpose and my purpose in our final and historical destiny. This term sovereignty is given throughout the Bible before we even showed up. Let me read some verses for you this morning of some of my favorite verses. Psalm 139, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. That's pretty heavy in itself. Before you were formed, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Psalm 139, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, as yet were none of them. Wow. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. And then Ephesians, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now Paul talked about that Romans 8 verse that all things, the good, the bad, the ugly of life, work together for our good and his glory. The concept of sovereignty. God has ordained and outlined exactly what he's doing and how he wants it done. There's no instance, no Manchester, no event in this world that catches him by surprise. And he goes, oh, I missed that one. God is 
in control of all things, which should give us comfort in this next subject I'm going to talk about. Rarely does God, and I would say rarely, does God take us from our conversion to our destiny in a straight line. And many of you are amening, confirming that fact. We have taken detours along the way. And there's a good reason for these things to end up in a detour. As many of you know, I'm in sales and marketing, and I spend most of my time behind the windshield of a car, driving from one client to another. And uh, particularly, I, one of my favorite drives is actually driving from here up to my clients in Dallas because I have three hours of uninterrupted time to either pray or just go through my thoughts with the Lord or I listen to different uh, audio sermons on the way up there and, and whatnot. It's a glorious time for me. But the thing that will throw a kink in my travel plans is I get about halfway there, I either get to uh, Fairfield or Corsican or somewhere, and as you've all probably traveled this route, they're always building on I-45. I don't know, ever know when it's going to be done, but it's always under construction. And all invariably, there will be a sign that says, detour ahead. And my countenance just automatically drops. And I'm like, oh, man. First of all, it's going to be delay. And I'm looking at my clock and looking at my schedule, wondering if I'm going to make my next appointment, because now I know I'm going to be delayed for who knows how long in traffic. I'm not thinking that the detour is probably a good thing because there's construction going on or there could be an accident that I avoid or something else. I'm just thinking about me and what my needs are and getting aggravated about it. That's often the kinds of things we react to when God places a detour in our life, not getting there on the straight and narrow path. So we're going to look this morning at the life of Joseph because what better character in the Bible than the verse I just read you in chapter 50, where he saves the nation of Israel? We're going to go back 22 years before that to chapter 37. So if you have your Bibles, you can be turning there this morning. But what is a detour? Well, as I explained to you, it is one that is a delay of where you're going. It's an unknown path. It could be scary. And it's usually one that makes me grumble or, you know, somewhat lose my Christianity. So, But a detour in God's eyes is a good thing. It's a good thing that feels bad. It's a good thing that feels bad. Because this detour that God has placed in our lives is for basically two reasons. One, we need some refinement. We need some reconstruction in our lives. We need to be refined in an area. We need to be prepared for the destiny. The second reason is that he's preparing the destiny for your arrival. Wouldn't it be horrible to arrive at your destiny and you're not ready for it? That would be awful. That, I can't think of anything worse that God could do, is put you in your destiny and you're not ready for your destiny. That's exactly what was going on in the life of Joseph this morning. How well we relate to the detours of life will determine how long it takes to reach your destiny. Anita read that passage this morning, the first 11 verses out of chapter 37. I won't go back through all of those, but I want to point out some facts for you about Joseph here. We read where he was in chapter 50, and we've gone back 22 years earlier to when he's 17 years old with his family. 
He's the 11th born son to Jacob. Now, this is important because Jacob had a lot of brothers that were older than him. And his father should have lavished on the older rather than him, but it says clearly that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other brothers. And this was because he came from Rachel. He loved Rachel. Rachel had passed away a year earlier. And so the love he had for her transferred to Joseph. Well, you can imagine being a dysfunctional family like it was, that that didn't go over well with the brothers. In fact, it says they hated him. They had nothing kind to say about him. But it gets even better because his dad gives him a multicolored tunic. Now, this was a garment similar to either a waist garment or a robe, but it was a vastly multicolored garment. It was extravagant. And it goes through scripture, as we'll see later, that Joseph was wearing this thing around in front of his brothers and everyone else to show and to put in their face that dad loves me more than you. Now you can imagine how the brothers reacted. said they hated him even more. And then lastly, God gives him a great gift as he's given you, given me, given others. Joseph had the ability to tell dreams, not just dreams, dreams that come true. Dreams that come true. He said, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheave rose up, and yours stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to my sheave. His brothers said to him, are you actually going to reign over us? You really going to rule over us? <laughs> he would. He would. So they hated him even more for his dreams. Then he had another dream. Joseph should have stayed up playing video games or something. <laughs> he related this to his father and his brothers. His, re his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come and bow yourselves down before you to the ground? They would. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Joseph has made such a pain of himself, they no longer want him with them. And so he's back home with his dad, and the brothers go off to shepherd the flock. Now we see one key thing here to the causes of a detour. Joseph was immature. Joseph didn't have, well, hadn't learned yet how to relay circumstances and things that he knew were true to his other family members. I can think of my own life that I've been on many a detour myself because I was immature. In fact, I've lost jobs in the past over things like this and been taken on a detour through a job excursion. So we see that we can cause our own detours. And that's why God said, I need to refine you. I need to reconstruct some things in your life, Joseph, so you'll be ready for your destiny. And at the same time, we'll see later on in the book, God is designing the end result, the destiny for Joseph's arrival. Now, if you look at how the sovereignty in our choices work, that's deep. That is fascinating. But it is nonetheless the fact of how God works. And he's working that way in our lives today. So we pick up the story the brothers went to Shechem. They're pastoring the sheep. And 
his dad says, Joseph, go out and see what your brothers are doing and see how they are doing. It says, when they saw him come from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. Yeah, his brothers don't like him. They hate him. And they said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into the pit. And we will say a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. Reuben said, no, 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 come on, guys, come on, it's our brother, we can't kill him. Let's not take his life. And so it came about that uh, Joseph reaching his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic and very colored tunic that was on him. And they took him and threw him into the pit. And now the pit was empty and without water in it. One of the things we know about a detour, folks, is God often takes us and strips us of something we hold dear. Something we hold dear. He will strip you of it. As he did Joseph's tunic. And then it gets sometimes worse before it gets better. They threw him in the pit. It said the pit was dry. There was no water. There's no nourishment. There's no way to get out. Sometimes he will throw us in the pit of life. In a detour. To get our attention. To tell us the only rock we have is him. The only one in the pit was God with Joseph. They sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from uh, Gilead, and their camels bearing gum and balm and myrrh and all the things they used to trade with on their way down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is this for to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers listen to him. What better plan is this? We'll just sell him as a slave. Get rid of him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, and so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And thus they brought Joseph to Egypt. Now, did you hear what I said? I know you heard what I said, but did you hear what I said? They brought Joseph out of the pit, sold him to the slave traders, and took him to Egypt, his destiny. Folks, when things don't look good in the pit of life, you have to remember, maybe the slave traders are coming along, and I'm headed to my destiny. We have to focus on what God is constructing in our lives and how God is arranging the destiny for our arrival. Instead of like me, grumbling and complaining, why, Lord, am I in this place? Why is it taking so long? And why am I not there yet? We're going to be introduced to another term here besides sovereignty, which is the term providence. Providence is that aspect of God where he actually reaches down into our time period and makes things happen. It's been called God's hand in the glove of history. I like that. God's hand in the glove of history. He's a God of time and he's a God of maneuvering circumstances to align your destiny with his sovereignty. Yes. Despite our choices, despite evil, despite other things in the world going on, he has that power to orchestrate that all together 
and make that happen. If we look at the time when Joseph now leaves with the Ishmaelite traders, he's off headed to Egypt. He's sold into slavery. He has no rights. Joseph himself probably thought, my dream, I know the dream's true. What's going on? This is not how a dream works out where you're going to rule over your brothers. But yet, that would be the case. He arrives at Potiphar's house. You remember the story. Potiphar's wife thinks he's a hottie and goes after him. He denies her. Falsely accused of rape, thrown in prison for two years. Pharaoh has a dream. Guess what? There's a dream teller. Guess what? There's a cup bearer that remembers, hey, oh, well, yeah, I forgot two years ago I met this guy that could tell dreams. And then there was the deliverance. In less than 24 hours and 22 years later, Joseph goes from being in prison to the second in command of Egypt. When the Holy Spirit and God's providence starts to move, folks, your destiny could happen just like that. It happened to Joseph. Less than 24 hours. In fact, this is what Pharaoh had to say about the Holy Spirit, Spirit and God's providence moving. Chapter 41 Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom his divine spirit resides? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, says, God has informed you of all this. There is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him in fine garments and linen, and put a gold necklace around his neck. He had him ride in his second chariot and proclaimed before him, bow the knee and set him over all the land of Egypt. Joseph had arrived at his destiny. Things can happen quickly when God's providence and the spirit of God move. So when we're in the pit, it's wise to ask, God, what are you teaching me? What are you refining in me so that I will be ready for my destiny? And at the same time, God is preparing the destiny for your arrival. Just as he did Pharaoh. Just as he did Joseph. We see quite a different Joseph in chapter 50 than we see in verse 30, or chapter 37. No matter your circumstances here this morning, God is aligning your providence and his sovereignty with his destiny. I'll give you some practical things to think about this morning in relationship to this story. I call it adopting a Joseph mentality in our own detours. We see several factors that went on in Joseph's life that are practical for our own living in Jesus Christ this morning. Alignment with God. Alignment with God. You will not see your destiny apart from God. God is the author of your destiny. Therefore, if you're apart from him, you won't see it. We need to be believers in Jesus Christ, submitting to him. There's one phrase that keeps coming up over and over in this story. And it's this phrase. And the Lord was with Joseph. 
and he prospered. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered in whatever circumstance it was. In the pit, with the slave traders, with Potiphar, with the jail sequence, the Lord was with Joseph. And I think it was because Joseph was with the Lord. That's the important point here is that we abide, as Jesus said in John 15, abide in the vine. Abide in vine Jesus. There is nowhere else to abide. There is nowhere else to find your destiny. We are a branch grafted to him and will bear his fruit for his glory and the maximum expansion of his kingdom. There's also an interesting pattern in that first opening verse I read to you in Genesis chapter 50 there. The pattern of the verse says this. Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? God, in God's place. As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. The pattern is evil, God, and good. Amen. We live in a fallen world, folks. We live in an evil place. Evil. We're surrounded by it. We read about it. We're affected by it. But when we insert God in the middle, it leads always to good. Always to good. Evil, God, good. If you leave God out, it don't lead to good. That's right. <laughs> so abide in the vine this morning. Second thing there is trust, surrender, and remain faithful. Like Ephesians 5.20, give thanks for all things. Give thanks for all things. We can give thanks for all things because we have a destiny. We may be on a detour, but he's moving us to the destiny. And we give thanks in all things because it may be something that we need to refine me. Maybe something refining you. It may be something that is occurring because the destiny is not ready for my arrival yet. We give all things thanks because he's sovereign. He knows what he's doing. We walk by faith and by the spirit and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This is sometimes difficult, folks, because God will put our faith on trial. We're good at fooling people and fooling myself that, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm... I have faith in you, Lord. Well, when he places you in the pit, he's placing your faith on trial. Do you really believe that, Jeff? Do you really have faith in me? What do you turn to as far as your resources in a cir circumstance or a particular trial that you go to before you go to me? Right. So we walk by faith and not by sight. Remain obedient. Remain obedient. There were so many instances in this story where Joseph could have disobeyed. He was seduced by Potiphar's wife. He could have uh, called to the uh, Egypt prison appeal system. Hey, I'm falsely accused. I shouldn't be in here. Joseph had the Lord. That's all he had. He had God. And that was sufficient for him. And his actions and his character reflected that. Does my character and my actions reflect that when I'm unjustly treated or I've caused it to myself? We need to be. We need to be obedient. You're meddling. <laughs> Become free. Forgive. 
There is one principle here that will hinder, block, and keep you from your destiny among all others. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. If we forgive, we will have access to the supernatural realm. If you don't forgive, it blocks the supernatural realm. And you could be on your detour for a while. For a while. So forgive. Forgive others. And it doesn't mean to forget. It means to set free so you're not in bondage to that power. And then lastly, <clears throat> we wait well. As I told you, these things take time. From where Joseph was as a 17-year-old, chapter 37, he's flaunting all his importance in front of his brothers. They hate him. They're going to kill him. God decides you need a detour. He has to go through the slave trading and the pit and the stripping of the tunic and on his way to Egypt. And then in verse 50, he's delivered to destiny. 22 years. 22 years. I know my brother can, less can relate to this in his struggles and detours of life. Some of these detours take a while. Some of them last a long time. And it's important that we wait well. Wait well. Verses that tell us to wait well come from Psalm 27. I would, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. In the land of the living, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, Wait for the Lord. No prison appeals. No whining and complaining. Just wait for the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Lamentations 3. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. And then Isaiah 40, most of us probably know this or could quote it. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice to me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles and they will run and not get tired. And they will walk and not get tired weary. Amen. The detours to destiny. We can expect them. We can embrace them because we have a sovereign God who is going to deliver us to the best place for you. The best place to display his glory and the best place to expand his kingdom. Keep on the lookout this week. Keep on the lookout. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your sovereignty, your providence who reaches into the glove of history, even with our choices and changes things, for our ultimate good, those called according to your purpose, to your glory, because we know you. Father, because you want others to know of you. And the 
expansion of your name and kingdom. That is our destiny and purpose this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would just use these words this morning to make us embrace it this week. Despite our circumstances, despite our pits, despite our slaveries, that you would make us realize you're moving us to our destiny. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. We pray for your protection over our lives and the deliverance of our destiny in due time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.